I don't sit in while you're running it down. I don't carry a gun. I drive. And I don't drive. And actually, nor does Nicholas. I think we, we both failed our driving tests numerous times. There are moments in this recording that the audio quality is weak. I've included subtitles and done the best that I could to maintain his words. I got sent the book and I sort of read it and I was really surprised because it was a submission, it was Universal who were doing it at the time and the idea was to do it as a big movie and then I read the book and it was this beautiful existential, you know, existentialist sort of Albert Camus style crime noir, crime novel. And I think what attracted you know, them to it was the idea of getaway driver by night, sort of stunt driver by day, and it's a concept idea. But I sort of fell in love with it in a way of, I'd always loved Westerns, and I'd love the man with no name, and Shane, and the idea of the lone, you know, the pale rider who, who, who kind of rides into town and, and saves the family. And so there were elements of that in parts of the book. It wasn't a chronological book, so I think it was deliberately very slow and everything. So there was quite, it, was, it, was, it was quite a big adaptation, but James Silas's mood was just so, and the tone was just so clear and perfect, and I fell in love with the books. What do you do? I drive. I've always felt the most important thing is, is that reading experience you have when you first read a book. Trying to refine that emotional experience is really important. When you do that, it sort of becomes a mix of you as the reader, you as the adapter, and the book as its own separate thing. And those three things start to merge. And, and it's quite hard over a series of, I don't know, four or five drafts in many years to hold on to that initial experience of, oh my God, I've just finished a book and nobody else has felt like it. You know, I just feel like this is a unique experience and that unique experience, I think, is what I always strive to capture in, in the adaptation that can very rarely succeed because of the process. I love index cards and with, with a more straightforward adaptation, I'd probably just take the scenes in the book and write them down as, you know, one line or an index card and then shuffle the cards around and use that as my structural kind of basis and, you know, throw out some cards um, replace them with new scenes, which I think would probably fit that and stuff. But with this one, it was slightly different because A, it was a lot of jumping back and forth between past and future. There wasn't really much of a plot. And so I sort of focused in on certain things that I found interesting, which, which were quite sometimes half a page in the book. So, you know, the relationship between Driver and Shannon was very small. The love story is quite small. Um, there's, it's, it sort of comes very briefly and goes. So it was almost about rebalancing the focus and taking the elements that were there and, and inventing, um, not reinventing, but stretching the story. So it was chronological and there was more development in some of those relationships over a longer length of time as well. How about this? Shut your mouth. Or I'll kick your teeth down your throat and I'll shut it for you. Actually, that's pretty much the first day on the job, was even before I started writing the first dropped that thing. We just went to see the Universal Head of Security and his first sort of comment was sort of there's almost no point doing a heist movie these days because helicopters, if at, if at the moment the police know about the heist, then the car can't get away from them. And so because of that, rather than going, oh, forget it, we can never make this movie, we went away and brainstormed without it. I remember driving around sort of downtown LA and they're, and they're just thinking, actually, what if you went, if there's an underpass? But, and then the whole Staples Center scene came from, okay, how about if we get him into a crowded situation where there's no eyes on him from helicopters and there's crowds and whatever. So so that that whole sequence came about from the very cynical head of security saying there's no way you can, you can do this. You know, on something, like this, the research is really important. I, I think I find with every script I write, I, it's actually my favorite part because it's probably the part that doesn't involve writing. Even when I write the day before, so the example, if, for example, if I'm writing the heist, I'll try to watch two or three heist sequences from other movies just to get into the mood. And I think it's, it's a sort of form of math writing. I think it's really important when you're writing generally because it's staying in that world that you're writing. Is, is, is a challenge with everything else that goes on in, in your life. I tend to write every day because I find if I take a day off, it takes me another day to get back into that world. And it, it's all about inhabiting that world. And so I, when I was doing Drive, for example, I remember just watching probably every film noir that I had in my collection because I'd always loved and reading really lots of books on film. You know, watching lots of westerns for the same thing. I don't have wheels in my car. <laughs> okay. It's one thing you should know about me. The experience of working with actors is the biggest thing I took away from it. And so, for example, Ryan Gosling brought something very unique to it, which is 
There's a scene where Driver and Stanwood meet for the first time and Irene is there. In my script version, it was always almost like a stare-off between the two men. It was almost like a competition. And the way Ryan performed it, he gave it, an, he gave it an innocence. It was almost like he wasn't aware that this guy, why this guy should be jealous. That made me realize that quite often a great actor with a great direction, whatever, that, that they will turn what's two-dimensional on the page into something three-dimensional. And, and quite often, I'd get sometimes pretty brutal notes and then go away and rewrite. And it was that sort of pressure. Each actor representing each character put me under as well, which I think sort of helped the script develop as well. For example, Shannon is a combination of two characters in the book. These are two separate characters, but I suddenly, I get a flash of another and I, and I tend to, with characters, I tend to get them quite quickly. They, they sort of come to me, so I don't, I don't do the biographies and whatever, it's just, it's just not my process. I get a flash of them and then through the writing, I sort of hear the voice and, and it sort of, you know, develop them over time. And, and, and often with an adaptation, if those characters, even if in a two or three lines are brilliantly drawn, it's like, I think, I just think in the book, I remember the stunt drive or that Sharon was based on that limp and there was something about how he was beaten up from all the various car crashes he'd had and he'd been John Wayne's, you know, double in a cowboy movie. Is, you know, that just instantly, without knowing where he'd gone to school or who he'd married, that instantly you start to just know that person. It sounds pretentious, but I, that's the only way I can describe it, really. And so so when I outline, for example, I, I tend to focus much, much more on plot and structure during the outline phase. And characterization, for me, just becomes more interesting with every draw. I'll see you in five minutes. See you in four. When I first started writing, I used to write for like eight, nine hours. And then I realized really quickly that anything I wrote in the afternoon, I was really rewriting the same line again and again. Again. So I just suddenly realized I'd probably got five hours writing in me a day. I just write from about, you know, 7.30 in the morning to about one or two. Then I really prepare for the next day and try to stay away from actually writing. I think having I talked about, you leave off where you can continue the next day. So at least you wake up in the morning, kind of excited about what you're going to write, not having to do the major part of the thinking when you write. And that's why I tend to do a lot of research and prep in the afternoon of the next day's writing, just to be able to scribble down various dialogue ideas or go, you know, my scene is going to be this beat, this beat, this beat, this beat. And, and then at least I've got some idea of what I'm going to do the next morning, even if that changes completely. If I haven't done that preparation, I'll often be really stuck. You know, I sort of write my way out of trouble. If, if I'm having a block or something, I just still need to go and spend those four or five hours, even if I'm not very good. Is he a bad guy? Yeah. How can you tell? Because he, he's a shark. There's no good sharks? I tend to find with action, my unconscious takes over more, and I can, mm. I can literally go faster when I'm watching a film. And, Whereas with dialogue, I do, I do, I find that more of a craft. I find I, because I was a kind of like dialogue which sounds not real because then you know everything, but, 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 but something that feels you could imagine someone next door to you saying in a restaurant or whatever. And I, I kind of like taking out the ornamentation. I'll often go, oh my god, that feels like it's written, and it feels it's too neatly phrased or it's too perfectly formed, and, and so I go, oh, I'll get rid of that. And, and so that involves quite a lot of craft I'd say and you know as, as a student I was very obsessed on the idea of pauses and what people don't say I'll try to put a line of description saying I mean he turns away and looks out of the window then the next line of dialogue so to, to almost create the sense of a pause if those lines are said without the silences if they're rust writing then they're going to sound bland but for example I can say it's a beautiful day outside but because you've heard me having a conversation with my mistress or my secret you know boyfriend on the phone or whatever but that very bland line takes on real weight the lines i often feel the happiest were the ones that most people consider really boring but a very simple line can be absolutely heartbreaking if, if the context is right you know the story about the scorpion and the frog your friend nino didn't make it across the river so much at screenwriting is certainly how you take notes and, and it's not just taking notes from one person it, it'll be 
producer, then a director, then a studio, then actors will give notes. And, and it's really how it survives that process, which I think determines ultimately if the script works. And then the film working is a whole different thing. So the first draft I wrote was probably closest to the book and he, he didn't say very much. And he, he, I, I deliberately not given him a backstory because it was my obsession with the Western and the man with their name. Then inevitably there was a series of notes came in which were about who is this person, backstory. And so I remember, I think the difference with the first draft, the second draft sort of turned into this bloated 128 page document. It suddenly had all that exposition. I don't think really worked and stuff, and just it just sort of got got too big. And then a director called Neil Marshall came in first. He's a very talented horror writer. But there were things that he brought to it, like in the book Driver, he goes and shoots some of the bad guys at the end. And and I'd done, I'd kept that in my first draft, whereas Neil had said, oh, he's a driver, he has to kill them with a car. So there were definitely quite brilliant things he brought to it. But then. He was off the project and then Nick came in and Nick really made it his own with a combination of really cutting it down to its bare bones. He also saw a fairy tale element in the story in which, which then kind of worked its way into the script. And so I think the shooting draft was 19 pages and one of the drafts had been 128 pages. It changed a lot over the, you know, the various drafts. With Neil Marshall, there was a horror element, which then turned into a fairy tale element. Um, so it evolved a lot. Nicholas, when he came on, he had a very good note, which was different to any note I'd ever heard before, which was he talked about that he wanted the second half to be more sort of muscular, is how he described it. And, and I think because he's a big fan of horror films, unlike the three act structure, it feels with a lot of horror films, it was almost like a roller coaster where it's set up, set up, set up, set up, set up, you know, and then goes wham really quickly. Um, so your roller coaster moved downwards at great speed. So I took out quite a few chunks from that second half, which I think gave Nick the rhythm he was looking for which was something much faster. So it actually just came and tumbled on top of each other and stuff. That was a note I remember being incredibly, not difficult, but hard for me to get my head around and then seeing afterwards why that note is being given. I mean, a lot of notes are really good too. As writers, we often feel, oh my God, notes are just all bad. And some notes are great and often even the bad ones tend to pick at something that's not right in the script. And there's almost like an electric shock therapy where I'll get the notes and be pretty battered by them, probably have a really sleepless night and think this just won't work and it's terrible. And then some kind of re-energizes you and allows you to write the next draft because as you know, it's really hard when you've written the draft to then have the energy to write the next one and the next one and the next one and to keep going. Quite often that's the kind of electroshock therapy of notes, I think. And it's not always pleasant uh, as an experience, but I think it's very useful. But I just want you to know, getting to be around you and Benicio was the best thing that ever happened to me. I think particularly with, with writing genre stuff, is trying to find where your personal life as a writer can actually find its way into that stuff. If you're doing a sci-fi thing, how, how do you find the scene? In it? How do you bring that reality, that truth and uniqueness with you as a person, you as a writer have? And how, how do you put that into a genre which is has got so many tropes and cliches and whatever. And I think I think that's some of the things I think about is is quite often, particularly with, with writers starting out, we tend to write scenes borrowing from something we've seen. And and so there's that classic character who does this, almost the lines you think, I've had that line like a dozen times before, and I that moment is what would you do? What would you really do in this situation if that alien is coming at you through the door. Do you really pull out your gun and just fire away or do you do it in a different way? And I, I just think it's asking those questions are really important.